so my name is Adam Quinn. I'm a PhD student in history at the University of Oregon. Uh, today I'll be talking about the role of science in the environment in the anarchist movement um, in the progressive era, which is the late 19th, early 20th century in the US. Um, I realize my internet connection might not be ideal since I'm in Oregon pretty far away. So I have more text in this PowerPoint than normally use. That way, if there are any audio issues, you can kind of read and get my general point. Um, so I have a few uh, key questions first. Um, what was the role of transnational science and the environment in the making of anarchism in the late 19th and early 20th century? And what might the lens of environmental history, which I, I use, uh, reveal about the history of anarchism? And um, I realized that I'm coming from a different discipline and area than many of the conference attendees. So I thought it might be worth uh, describing some of the literature I'm engaging with here. Um, so one of the em eminent works on the history of, progressive, of, of the progressive era is Daniel Rogers' uh, Atlantic Crossings, Social Politics in the Progressive Age. And uh, Rogers looks at the late 19th, early 20th century where there are all these progressive reformist efforts uh, in the US, but also in Europe and, and Australia. And these are all trying to address the different um, negative effects of unbridled industrial capitalism. So um, Rogers points out how these politics were not un uniquely American. So even though America calls it the progressive era, um, these progressive politics were not unique to the US and actually were made transnationally through different connections between the US, Europe, and Australia. So in the field of environmental history in particular, uh, this has been an influential book as well. So um, environmental history, history has emphasized the role of scientific authority and place in conservationism and forestry and urban reform. And by place, I basically mean uh, experience that's tied to a location. So how does the environment, how does human interactions with the environment over time create place? And how does that, how does that place um, influence different human activities like politics? Um, and this field has been influenced by Rogers as well. So for example, a lot of them written about um, US forestry practices and how they were in, uh, influenced by uh, German silver culture and how often that didn't actually go, go so well because um, US forests are actually very different from German ones. So there's a lot, there's a lot being, being, being written about how um, the US and Europe have a lot of interactions on um, not just progressive policies, but also conservationist ones and uh, scientific and environmental processes as well. And a lot of this progressive era environmental history focuses on uh, basically government and middle class reformers. Um, there's only a pretty small but, but growing field of working class environmental history. Uh, and that tends to look at how um, workers have responded to local uh, work and living conditions. So um, this goes to workers uh, try to address you know, dangerous work environments in, in coal mines, for example or how workers in industrial cities tried to address air and water pollution. Um, so always pretty uh, locally focused, not really transnational in scope when it comes to working class environmental history. Um, so some of these works do acknowledge that much of the American workforce were immigrants, but we don't see the same sort of transnational intellectual history uh, that we see for other more middle-class or governmental environmental movements of the time. That I think looking at the history of anarchism helps fill uh, anarchism in the U.S. is a largely immigrant movement, and during the progressive era, it was the principal ideology of working class immigrant radicalism. And that's where my argument comes in. Um, I argue that like progressivism, uh, anarchism was informed by and informed transnational ideas and natural sciences. So in exploring this relationship between science and anarchism reveals a form of anarchist environmental politics. And anarchist pr perspectives on issues like um, the body, space, and work were shaped by Bayer and other, and other anarchists um, in concurs with nature and science. So that's basically the main themes I'm exploring here. And first I'll discuss um, some of the uh, more classical anarchist theorists who really um, influenced a lot of these uh, debates around nature and science in, our, in earlier anarchist history. Um, so first I'll discuss uh, L.S.A. Reclus, who is an anarchist geographer and conservationist. Um, he was a uh, he basically tried to use geography and natural and human history together to advocate for what he, what he called communist anarchism. And for those who aren't familiar, this, that basically means, um, you know, common ownership, ownership of the means of production. Um, it's uh, anti-state, anti-capitalist. It really emphasizes, to include uh, spontaneity, um, uh, 
anti-authoritarianism, anti-authoritarianism, of course. Um, and who also advocated for vegetarianism, nudism, and conservationism. So he brought up a lot of environmental issues alongside his anarchism as well. And uh, these ideas were very influenced by Rukou's own experiences of place and mobility. So um, uh, since he was a geographer, he often traveled a lot. Um, earlier on in his career, he traveled throughout Latin America. He actually spent some time on an American slave plantation in Louisiana and uh, as a tutor. And there, that really informed his um, kind of anti-authoritarian, anti-capitalist politics. So his different um, experiences of place as he traveled the world really influenced his ideas. Um, he also uh, had a pretty anti-racist for a time uh, belief system uh, because of his encounter with a lot of different cultures as well. Um, and mo mobility, of course, is very central to this too. So often environmental historians just focus on place, you know, you know workers in Chicago and how Chicago influence their politics. But for the anarchist movement, which was very mobile, had a lot of immigrants that had a lot of traveling scholars. Mobility was also very central, so traveling through different places was very central to the making of these ideas. And those, of course, in, in this early history of Reclue, and I'll talk about Kropotkin as well, um, imperialism, colonialism, and global capitalism are also kind of central to the uh, start of anarchist ideas as well, because this mobility was made possible by these systems that they opposed. So um, Reclue, um, had a very significant impact on the anarchist movement. Uh, his ideas helped inform how anarchists understood nature, cities, and the world, which his work all addressed. Um, he tried to, you know, basically argue for a more just, equal, egalitarian city. Um, and by having a well-established geographer to read and reference, anarchists were also able to argue their philosophy was historically and scientifically informed by scientific, scientific expertise. And uh, Rokli was also connected to American conservationism, like uh, George Perkins Marsh, who's a big name in environmental history, uh, corresponded, corresponded with um, Rokli and said him as a, as a reference. So this is something that often the field of environmental history ignores, but he was, he was ironically a pretty large influence on conservationism and also on early um, environmental history as well. Um, he was an influence on the Annales School, which influenced environmental history. Uh, early environmental historians actually decided to reclue, but it often he was kind of lost to time. And um, Peter Kropotkin was similar in a lot of ways in that he was also a geographer, also an anarchist. He uh, was also influenced by his travels. He traveled to um, Siberia, to Asia, to uh, Northern Europe. And those uh, travels all really informed his politics, uh, his encounters with different cultures and with different environments um, really impacted his own um, political upbringing. And um, he basically used science, most famously geology and evolutionary biology, but also geography and natural history to argue in favor of anarchism. So for example, in Mutual Aid Factor Revolution by Kropotkin, uh, he uses different um, examples from nature like bees and ants who cooperated to argue for how um, uh, cooperation was actually a part of um, evolution. It's not just the survival of the fittest individually, but also uh, mutual aid and cooperation help species evolve. So that's trying to trying to push back a little bit on the individualist um, social Darwinism of the time. And um, this is actually something that environmental historians call multi-species co-authorship. So he was informed by um, non-human species in his own thinking and writing. So, that, so when we consider that, we can see the agency of non-human animals in his work. Um, the fact that bees and ants cooperate socially uh, made some of his ideas possible. If we didn't have those examples in nature, he wouldn't have been able to make the same arguments in his own, in his own work. So in a lot of different ways, um, non-human nature really made possible anarchist arguments and also helped justify anarchist arguments. And um, Mikhail Bakunin was also one of, one of his early anarchist philosophers. Uh, he's sometimes cited as an anti-science anarchist, like one of, one of the original, like more critical of science anarchists. Um, he called for the revolt of life against science. But he was actually not really anti-science. He, um, as you look more into that quote in the background of it, he wanted equal access to science rather than having it exist as a separate elite domain in society. So he wanted the working class to access science, not just you know, the, the elite intellectuals. Uh, he was also a close friend and political ally throughout, throughout his life with uh, Elisir Clue as well. 
Um, so these were not discounted or, you know, at conflict movements. Uh, Bakunin actually, um, I think, appreciated a lot of the scientific contributions made by Rapunin and Prokhorkin. And he also um, made the argument for what we later would call uh, legitimate authority. So, and then in this quote here, he says, does it follow that I reject all authority, authority as an anti-authoritarian? Um, far from me, such a, such a thought. In the matter of boots, I refer to the authority of the boot maker. So he's really calling for um, expertise through work here and ra rather than, you know, um, authority through uh, just having political power. And that really connects to the scientific uh, themes here because of course, if people have scientific ex expertise that makes their ideas more valid and have more authority. And these ideas from European thinkers were brought over by American, by immigrants to the US, uh, by traveling radical speakers and by the radical press and vice versa as well, so it went both ways. Um, the scientific authority generated interest in publications and lectures um, by anarchists. And anarchist immigrants brought environmental ideas with them since they were bringing these classical anarchist ideas with them. They also brought these environmental ideas that these anarchists had with them as well. And they transformed these ideas to address different local issues by place and it varied by place. Um, so like in the agricultural US-Mexico borderlands, uh, that would have like a uh, communal land distribution politics. Uh, in the urban northern US, it was a little bit different. It, uh, they had a lot of mutual aid societies, radical unions, and um, militant variations on urban progressive era women's movements. So uh, often the women's movement in that, in that period was focused on uh, the right to vote. Um, anarchists had some, some different interests there. And I'll talk about some of that now because in my limited time with the rest of my speech, um, I'll talk about how um, US and European anarchisms uh, transnational encounters with eugenics and anthrop anthropometry. So um, turn of the century anarchists were engaged in transatlantic debates surrounding eugenics. And this is of course a natural science, the science of the body, even though it's today a, a pseudoscience, it was still at the time part of the scientific discourse. Um, anarchists did not pose the fundamental principles of eugenics at the time, later on of course they did, uh, but they stressed different problems and solutions. So uh, they had different, different views of who were undesirable, un undesirable to prevent the improvement of the human race. Of course, that would have been the, the ruling class rather than you know, the people with disabilities or the, the working class. So uh, they would have, people like Kropotkin argued that um, you know, the rich were actually the ones who were undesirable and you know, needed to be eliminated from the germ pool, if you will. Uh, they argued for working class birth control access. Um, and they also advocated for urban environmental change. So it wasn't really the uh, eugenics of sterilization that we're used to encountering, but as a very different kind of eugenics. And then um, here on the right in this cartoon, this uh, sweatshop boss is uh, telling this policeman to arrest uh, who looks like Emma Goldman because she's advocating for uh, birth control. And if there's birth control, like he gets less cheap labor in the future in the form of working class children. So this is also a class issue, not just a scientific one. Um, Kropotkin actually spoke on eugenics at the first International Eugenics Congress in London, 1912. And this, this was reprinted for US audiences as well, so it traveled across the Atlantic. Um, Kropotkin did not question eugenics' goal of germ improvement, but post sterilization. He argued instead for urban environmental reform and to address social and environmental contexts that cause uh, disease and crime in the human race. So he thought if there were more equal cities um, and more you know, clean cities and so on, there would be less disease and less crime. And that would be a different way of achieving the same goals as eugenics, which wanted to achieve those through sterilization. Um, and this, these, are, these debates really influenced the movement itself in the US. So immigrant, immigrant anarchists in the urban, urban northern US really passionately argued for birth control rights. Um, this was a pretty militant and illegal uh, act that they took on um, under the Comstock Act and other laws, it was illegal to actually print anything about uh, birth control, it was illegal to speak about it. So a lot of anarchists, most famously Emma Goldman, but many others as well, were arrested time and time again for um, speaking about birth control. Um, and this was part of a more general ethic of nature and science that stressed bodily and social autonomy. So in the quote on the right, we can see that where this anarchist um, uh, moral of health and nature where they want morals to only be about um, what, whatever is natural, whatever is good for the human body. And um, that's really contrasted with, the, with their understanding of socially constructed um, religious and legal codes. Of course, their own positions are also socially constructed, but 
they saw religion and the law as you know more abstract, more false than whatever could be observed in in the body and in nature. And eugenics and anarchist movements were interconnected um, through place. Uh, they often organized in the same kind of urban locations uh, through scientific understandings. They have the same kind of scientific debates, same scientific circles, uh, political goals. Like I mentioned, like they have the same goals of um, you know improving the conditions of the working class sometimes, improving the conditions of the human race, of course, and um, shared experiences of oppression and defense. So like I mentioned, uh, many anarchists were arrested for birth control speeches and writings. Um, it's so, of course, were other parts of the eugenics movement. And um, there, there was a lot of overlap there. So um, different parts of the eugenics movement um, would, would have uh, participated in anarchist defense trials as well. So these were definitely not um, opposed movements, even if they were separate at times. Uh, they had a lot, of, a lot of connections through oppression and through defense and through their ideas. And some major anarchists who were involved in the um, eugenics movement were Moses Harman, William Harman, and Emma Goldman. So Moses Harman published Lucifer, the, the Lightbringer in the late 19th century, which was an anarchist um, newspaper that also um, had one, as one of his main goals, it had um, uh, eugenics and birth control rights. So um, on the right here this is from Lucifer, the Lightbringer. And um, it says, uh, Lucifer's specialty is sexology or sexologic science, believing this to be the most important of all sciences because most intimately connected with the origin or inception of life from character for good or ill, or for strength or weakness, for happiness or misery, for sex affairs, and upon, the, upon the, each individual. So here we can see how um, this anarchist publication is very interested in science and believes that um, the science of sexology was the most important, and that really informed the anarchist politics at the time. So Lucifer, the light, the light bearer, becomes the American Journal of, of Eugenics later on. So it becomes um, less about anarchism in general and more about um, uh, eugenics in particular over time. Um, so it becomes the, the American Journal of Eugenics and eventually that closes down and their discovery base is sent to Mother Earth, which is Emma Goldman's anarchist publication. So there's a lot of overlap in terms of, you know, the practical subscriptions and writing of the publications throughout the early 20th century. And I think this is something that a lot of anarchist scholars um, overlook sometimes because it's not, it's not their focus or because they view eugenics in negative light, so they don't really look this direction, but more recent scholarship as, as in exploring the role of eugenics and anarchism. Uh, anarchism was also engaged with anthropometric sciences. This would have been like um, your different body sciences, body measurements like uh, physiognomy and phrenology. So, you know, measuring of skulls, uh, measuring of face shapes to determine a people's racial character and individual character. Um, anarchists, you know, challenged some debates within this field but did not question its underlying foundations. So for example, um, Cesare Lombrosa was a big um, uh, anthropometric uh, criminologist. And this is like from his work on the right here. Um, this is uh, 100 and I forget the exact number, but it's uh, over 100 anarchists from Turin, Italy that he um, analyzed and then uh, looked at the, you know, the shape of their jaws, the faces and so on, and compared them with criminals in, in a Turin prison. And he found a lot of overlap between anarchists and criminals and basically was arguing that they have the same biology, the same natural impulses towards crime. Um, anarchists uh, had, had some important differences. He argued against actually um, hanging anarchists because of, he thought they could be reformed later in life. But he did compare them to like a natural born criminal. Uh, Pietro Gori was this Italian anarchist uh, who also lived in the US and you know moved around the world like many anarchists. Um, and he argued against Lombroso, arguing that um, anarchists actually were naturally inclined to be a noble uh, kind of race. They were, they had noble features. Um, they were not criminal, but they were had desirable features instead. So we didn't challenge the underlying uh, now pseudoscientific um, foundations of the field, but he tried to instead present anarchism in a positive light. And I think by looking at the, the anarchism history of eugenics and, and, and anthropometry, we can see how radicals have the capacity to intervene in oppressive uh, scientific debates and practices, but also they were influenced by their practices as well. Um, it's something I think we have to be aware of because science is always um, influenced by society and by culture. Um, and this included not only eugenics and anthropometry, but also geography and biology. So uh, even Kropotkin and Raku's ideas were influenced by the you know colonialist geography, geography and the often racist biology ideas of the time. Um, 
of course, they, they tried to push back on a lot of that, but they are still influenced by these often impressive fields and they work through those lenses. And we can also see how um, trans the transatlantic exchange of social and scientific ideas were intertwined with the history of uh, transnational migrant and print radicalism. And I think that's an important thing we have to um, study to better understand both science and radicalism. So uh, in, in conclusion, um, anarchists were influenced by and influenced the natural sciences and the scientific discourse uh, lent authority and legitimacy to anarchist ideas. And by engaging with natural sciences, anarchists developed a form of environmental politics that provided radical perspectives on questions surrounding the body, like eugenics, uh, the built environment, like Kropotkin and whose ideas about the city and work, like um, eugenics itself, this is about working class uh, freedom, but also uh, more generally uh, informed, I think, the union, union labor politics as well. Um, in the future, I'll be looking at how the environmental politics of anarchism changed from the 19th century anarchist movement to late 20th century radical environmentalism. Uh, this presentation focused mostly on stuff I could get online since we're under a pandemic. So some of this, um, you know, classical anarchist thought might, might be more familiar to some, some in the audience, but this is basically what I had to, what I had to work with for, for now. And in the future, I'll be doing more archival research uh, later in the, in the 20th century as well. Mm -hmm.